Hi, and welcome to the OpenSAT Kit Core Flight Executive Table Service Tutorial. Conceptually, a table is a logical group of parameters that are managed as a named entity. Tables are managed in binary files on the ground, and files are transferred between the ground and flight, so the file name serves as the table name. After a table is ingested by the CFE, ground commands use text strings to reference a table with the format appName.tableName. Application code uses a table handle supplied by the CFE table service to reference their table data. This figure shows a high-level view of table loads and dumps. Table services uses two buffers for each table. An active buffer, which is the image accessed by an app as it executes, and the inactive buffer, which is the image that is manipulated by operations during a table load. The term table load refers to a sequence of commands that are performed to transfer data from a file into an application's active buffer. Table dumps directly transfer data from either the inactive or active buffer to a file. Note that table services maintains the buffers and applications perform functions like polling for a pending table load. Applications also need to get and release pointers to the active buffer. This design keeps table operations synchronized with the application's execution cycle, so the application will never be operating on a partial table load. We'll get into the details of loads and dumps, but first we'll use an example app to better understand why and how tables are used. The Data Storage app, or DS for short, reads messages from the software bus and stores them in files. Conceptually, that's pretty simple functionality. However, DS is very configurable because of its two tables, and they are what make it such a powerful app. The filter table identifies which packets DS should subscribe to on the software bus. For each packet, it identifies one or more files that the package should be stored into, and a filter can be applied to determine whether every packet is stored or selected packets based on time or the packet sequence counter. The file table defines which files are created, how they are named, and the criteria for when to close a file and open a new one. The DS functional details are not important for the remainder of this lesson. I'll be using DS's table to illustrate table service features. I'll be using DS's file table during this tutorial. The default values are defined in the C source code file DS underscore file underscore TBL that I have opened. OpenSAT is configured for a fictitious satellite called SimSat. The first DS file table entry is configured to store event messages. We can see the path name, the base name of events, and the file extension of .dat. The file will be closed when either the max file size or the max file age is reached. During the build process, this file gets converted to a .tbl file and is copied into the slash cf directory, which has been configured as the CFE app startup directory. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of the file, and here we see a macro that defines the CFE table file name, ds.file underscore table, and it also defines the name of the file, .tbl file, that will be generated during the build process. I'm going to hide these windows and we'll take a look at DS's filter table in the table registry. The CFS has already been started. On the right is the CFS console window displaying event messages, and in the center is the table service page. This page can be launched from the main OpenSAT kit page. It is divided into four sections. The first section is the ground interface section, and it allows you to access all the table service commands and telemetry packets. The commands in the third row run a Ruby script that manages the process for flight software commands that generate files. The script will send a table service command, transfer the file, and then launch the Cosmos Table Manager tool to display the binary file. The section, second section launches a table management screen, which gives you access to all the table management features, and we'll be using that later in this lesson. The third section is for learning and is where you can run demos, view training slides, etc. The fourth section contains some key table service housekeeping packet values. Note that 95 tables have been registered. Most, most of these are from stored commands. We'll be looking at more of these data points during the table load and dump examples. We're now going to take a look at DS's table registry, and we have two ways of doing this. First, we're going to send a command to send an individual registry entry for the DS file table. So first we need to display the telemetry registry entry telemetry packet. And second, we need to send the registry command. So we need to enter 
the table name, which is ds.file underscore tdl, and we'll hit send. So this just sent the, the packet for the DS file table registry entry. At the top of the packet is your standard CCSDS header. And then starting with this size, this is the size of the table in bytes. Then we have the CRC. We have some addresses. We have the last time it was updated. We have some other table attributes shown here. And we notice that it's been loaded once. Its name is ds.file underscore table. And this was the default table name used. It is not a critical table, and that means it would be saved across a process or reset. And we notice there's no loads pending. It's a, not a dump only table, and it's not a double buffered table, and that's another attribute we'll get into later. The other way we can look at this table registry is actually to dump the entire registry. And as I mentioned, this third row runs a Ruby script to do the full processing for us. So if we hit display file, it's now dumping the table, and now it issued a TFTP command to send the table registry log file down to the ground. And when this is complete, it's automatically gonna launch the table manager tool, so then we can take a look at the binary file. So it's successfully transferred the file, and now we can start table manager. If we go under file, open, we're gonna go to the file server, now we're going to need to change the filter to all files. And if we sort by the most, the date, we see that CFE table registry log is at the top. Now we, now we're going to open a text file that defines the binary contents for the Cosmos table manager. And I like to sort these by alphabetical so I can easily go down CFE table underscore reg text. Now we're going to open. Now we're getting a warning here, and this is just a warning, even though it says error. Um, the table binary definition file has been for the maximum number of tables in the registry, and our current registry doesn't have that maximum. So this warning is telling us that the binary file size does not match the definition file. We can hit OK. So now we have a display of the, the complete table service registry. And at the beginning is a standard header for CFE files. And then we get into the entries, and each of these entries is just like the entry that was telemetered in the telemetry packet. So if we scroll down until here we found entry 0 is, in fact, the DS table that we're looking for. So we had the size, and I'm not going to go through all the attributes, but we can see that we get down to the name and the file loaded. And it's not a critical table, so there we are. And then we have entries for all the other files that were loaded here. Here's a sequence diagram showing the table load process. We have four components involved in the process. The ground system, which is Cosmos. The file transfer app, which is TFTP. The table service app, and an app that owns the table. Time flows from top to bottom. Notice that the app with the table is periodically calling table services to see if a table management function is pending. This is typically performed in an app's housekeeping cycle, which will be described in a moment. Also, the table API provides flexibility in how to manage tables, and I'm showing the simplest method. This is an unconventional UML sequence diagram since I'm showing data stores with green arrows identifying data flows. The steps in a table loader as follows. First, transfer the file from ground to flight. This step is not always required. In practice, it's common to store multiple table files on board so they can be loaded for a particular operational scenario. Second, issue the table load command. Table services copies the file image to the inactive buffer. Loads can be partial or complete. Partial table loads are not that common, but when they do occur, first the active buffer is copied to the inactive buffer, then the partial contents from the file are overlaid into the inactive buffer. Third, issue a validate table command. The table validation won't occur until the app with the table calls the manage function. Table services will call the app's callback function, allowing the app to validate the contents of the inactive buffer before they are used. Fourth, issue an activate table command. The table won't be activated until the app calls the manage function. When this is done, table services copies the contents of the inactive buffer to the active buffer. If an app needs to perform any one-time processing based on the new table contents, 
then it would be done at this time. Now we're going to load DS's file table. I'm going to use the default file that's already the flight software file system, so we won't need to do a file transfer. First, I'm going to send the table load command. And for this, we need to specify the file name. Which is ds underscore file underscore tdl dot tdl. And also note before we send this that the free shared buffer count is four. So we now send it, we get an event message saying it's successful load, and we see that the free shared buffer went down to three. And the reason for this is because this is not a double buffered table, and data store is using a shared pool of buffers in the table services. There is a concept of a double buffer where then a dedicated inactive and active table could be dedicated for the particular apps table. Next, we're going to send the validate table command. And for this, we're going to need to specify the table. So zero, we can validate the inactive table. And the name, as you recall, the name is now, we're going to use the reference of ds.file underscore tbl. If you notice, the command counter went up. The validation count went up. And I get an event message that says the DS validation successful for the inactive buffer. And now we can do an activate table command. And again, we'll have to specify the table name. DS.file underscore TBL. And we send it. Successfully loaded. And we say the load pending went from one to zero. So there you've done the three steps of loading a table, validating table, and activating the table. Here's the sequence diagram for the table dump process, which is much simpler than a table load. Three components are involved, the ground system, Cosmos, TFTP, and table service app. You simply send a table dump command and a command specified buffer, either the active buffer or the inactive buffer, is copied into a file. Next, you transfer the file from flight to the ground. We are now going to dump and display DS's file table. For this, we're going to use the table management page. This has a convenient dump table button, and it's going to prompt us for the table name, which is ds.file underscore table. Next, it's prompting us for the file name to receive the table data. I'm going to stick with the default, which is a CF, and then this is tempbin.dat file. Now it's asking which buffer do we want to dump, and we're going to dump the active table buffer. And we see get an event message saying that the bin table was loaded with the DS file table. Now we're getting a prompt to say, do we want to transfer the file and display it? And we do. So TFTP command has been sent, and the file has been transferred. Now we get a window that, to launch the table manager. So this is the Cosmos table manager. We're going to open a file, a binary file that was transferred. Table files are by default sent to a table directory. And if we sort by the modified date, we see the temp bin date, that file. Next, we're going to need the text file that can decode the table contents. So I've sorted it, and if we go down to DS, File, Table, Text, we will open the file. At the top, we have the standard CFE header, and that ends at the description that says Table Dump Image. Next, there's actually a table header that's before the actual data data. And here we can see the description, OpenSAT Kit Default, DS.File Table, the number of bytes, we could have also specified the command that we weren't prompted for, but you can do an offset and not dump the entire table. Next, we now we see the table contents. And as we noted in the C source code, here's the entry for the first, uh, the contents for the first entry, which was the SimSat event message data file. This is the high level application flowchart that was introduced in the CFE overview lesson. I will step through it and highlight some common table service API usage. 
Applications can use tables in different ways, so there are multiple ways to use the Table Service API. The app development tutorials go into much more detail. During initialization, apps must first register their table and then perform a load to populate with initial values. The load can either be from a memory location or a file. If an app saves the table address globally, then it is common to get the address during initialization. During the command and functional processing, if the app has the table address stored globally, then it can simply access the table. The modified function is shown because if an app has a command that can modify its table contents, then the app should call this function after the table contents are modified. The housekeeping cycle is when table management is typically performed. Apps can call the manage function or they can check the status and call the validate or update functions. The release address function is called prior to any management function so the table service can change buffers if needed, and the get address is called last so the app gets the address of the latest table. During app cleanup, an app should unregister its table prior to exiting to free up its resources. Here are some system considerations when using tables. Commands are typically used to initiate an action, but not tables. For example, commands are used to change the spacecraft control mode, but the control mode gains are defined in a table. Sometimes convenience commands are provided to change the table elements. For example, scheduler app provides an enable disable scheduler table entry. Tables do not typically contain dynamic data computed by the flight software. However, the CFE does not preclude this and tables have been used as a convenient method to collect data, save it to a file, and transfer it to the ground. These are defined as dump-only tables. The checksum app can be used to verify the contents of static tables that don't change. Tables can be shared between applications, but this is rare. Tables are not intended to be an inter-application communication mechanism. Most tables are single buffered and can be loaded and dumped, so a convenience macro has been defined with these defaults. There's a notify by message API where the table service sends a software bus message to an application when a table needs managing, so the app does not need to periodically call the manage function. Table services has a double buffer feature. This is when an active and inactive buffer are dedicated to an app rather than from a shared buffer pool. Double buffers require more memory, so they should only be used when needed. As we saw with data storage, table files are binary, so ground tools are required to create tables and to display tables. The binary files contain a CFE file header, a table header, and the table data. A final system consideration is how tables are managed across resets. The table registry is cleared for power on and processor resets. Applications must always register and initialize their non-critical table data during the app initialization process. If a table is registered as critical, then during a processor reset, the table service will use executive services to locate and load their preserved table data from a critical data store. This concludes the CFE table service tutorial. Thanks for tuning in.